And our scripture reading this morning from the Old Testament again um, puts us into the words of the prophet Isaiah, those messages of foretelling the coming of Christ. And this morning we read from Isaiah 35, verses 1 through 10. I invite you to hear God's word for us this morning. Joy of the redeemed. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strength, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. God will come with vengeance, will, with divine retribution. God will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the Way of Holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. And then our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew in the first chapter, verses 18 through 25 as we hear the story of Joseph. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. This is God's holy word for us this morning. On this third Sunday of Advent, we look back across the generations to Joseph's story. Joseph, a quiet man, at least across the scriptures, a carpenter who might have spoken better with his hands. Quiet except for what was churning within. Joseph, ready for a smooth season in his life, no rough edges, no slivers, no cracked places to work around. It never came. Taking a wife, building a home, and starting a family 
all in due time, of course, was his dream. Ready or not, the time came for this all to happen at once, for time itself had become a sliver. So he began with the words familiar to every Jew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed are thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who makes peace, who creates all things. How was Joseph going to be able to find some peace and joy in what he had learned from Mary, the woman he was betrothed to, engaged? At least not peace in a straight way, or entirely, even though he was a regular at the synagogue reciting the prayers by heart again and again. Mary, a young maiden, the arrangements had been made between families and a small dowry given, but God had not shared the fine print on the marriage covenant for what was to come after the betrothal. Even if Joseph had foreseen her too soon pregnancy and his own more long labored pain, would he have stepped away, left her on her own? Joseph most certainly was happy to be taking a wife, at least before he saw what love would require of him. I'm going to have a child, Mary said. There was no laughter in her voice then, only sober truth and secrets. Secrets she could not fully tell, for she did not fully know, this being her first baby, she being so young, yet suddenly so far off wise and faithfully courageous. So unflinching she was, telling Joseph her news, all other sound was tuned out, all light snuffed out. The world in that moment turned upside down. Then came the bitterness, the humiliating loneliness, the sense of overwhelming nothingness. Joseph knew the child she carried was not his. Whose then? Joseph must have wanted to walk away, leave her in her shame, or at least ask her the name of the father and then go confront the man. But none of that would change the shock of being caught between a dream and this betrayal. Oh Lord, Joseph must have cried out, it is hard to be a man when your manhood seems at stake. Mary said she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. What was he to think, hearing such an outrageous claim? Mary had audacity. He had to give her that. You have to forgive me, Lord, Joseph must have pleaded. My doubt that you were the one, the father of the child, rooted in her womb. However much Mary may have wished it so, to spare her innocence, to preserve her vow to Joseph, his part was simply to provide what was necessary. But what a seemingly far-fetched explanation Mary shared. Forgive me, O Lord, forgive the doubts. Yet if it is true what Mary claimed, that if her condition was the Spirit's doing, and the Messiah was growing in her womb. Isn't that so very much for a man, for Joseph, to take on? And Mary's announcement, the betrayal, was indeed already done. The insult, a blow delivered like the swing of a hammer. O Lord, King of the universe, Joseph must have prayed, who am I to believe? Who am I to forgive? All Joseph knew was that Mary's child was not his. It was between Mary and whoever. 
But Mary said it was the Spirit. Mary said it was God. Still, for Joseph, it was whoever. After all, the between Mary and whoever did not include Joseph. He was on the outside, excluded. But Joseph did not walk away. It was Mary, Joseph tried to forgive. Accepting the situation, yes, at least according to the law. Quietly divorce her, don't make a scene, don't cause a scandal. But it was a hard thing put upon Joseph, a hard truth to accept. Then the dreams came, like ghosts haunting Joseph to wakefulness. Voices telling him to not be afraid, take Mary as his wife. Was it God's voice, or Mary's, or Joseph's? Take her as your wife, and despite the shame, despite the slow, unyielding pain, be willing to embrace the pain and accept what is. Joseph stayed. God must have counted on that although other plans could have been made had he faltered. Joseph stayed. He did not walk away. Was he too desperate to leave? A man so committed to a relationship because it was better than no relationship at all? Was Joseph too weak to stand up for himself, letting Mary walk over him rather than bringing her down? Yet, would causing her to fall put him back on his feet again? Joseph chose a better way. Was it wounded pride that wouldn't let him leave? Pride, like a broken leg on a valued chair that he was driven to repair. Joseph stayed. He chose a better way. Or was it that Joseph loved Mary and love betrayed is still love? Joseph stayed even if a bit reluctantly. Joseph chose a better way. He became useful. Carpenters are, you know. They must have, that must have been the plan. The whispers, the talk behind his back. Joseph knew what they were thinking what they were saying. But Joseph became useful, preparing a home while Mary was away visiting her relative Elizabeth. Joseph kept busy, making a cradle, using his hands, staying busy, and preparing for God's child. So when the registration decree came down from the Roman government, they had no choice. Off to Bethlehem, Joseph took Mary, great with child, home to the town of David, the home of generation upon generation before. Joseph got them there safely, but scarcely in time and bedded in a stable, for there was no room anywhere else. Joseph was useful. He had chosen a better way. Joseph wrapped Mary, a newly born babe, in a cloak, found old skins in corners to cover them, heaped straw around Mary's feet, and with his body shielded them from the wind. He stuck to the chores. It gave him something to take his mind off of what splintered in his heart. Some small purpose to sustain him throughout those days. So when the boy was two, this little Jesus, there came other dreams to torment Joseph. Dreams with awful warnings this time. Was it God's voice that spoke of Herod's terrible plan for the children, the innocents? If this was God's son, where was the protection, the safety? Joseph was told to take Mary and the son who wasn't his and flee for their safety. They were his responsibility, 
Joseph chose the better way. <clears throat> the trip to Egypt to escape Herod's madness was all bundles of rations and ropes and careful routes and repairs on the road, places to stay, bits of work to pay for things. Joseph's chores, his duty. Then came the trip back to Nazareth, the shortcuts, short supplies, the weariness of yet another journey. Joseph got them back safely. God must have known he would, or he would not have had a dream telling him to go. Joseph, who chose a better way, who provided like a father, cared, taught, watched, wondered, and worried like one too. A family, and Joseph loved him, this almost son that was not quite his, peace and joy, a carpenter surrogate father who made the choice. Joseph chose a better way. Joseph's better way was one without fear, courageous, and above all, faithful. Faithful to Mary, faithful to this son that wasn't quite his, faithful to his God, to the leading of the Spirit. As far as Joseph knew, his betrothed Mary had been unfaithful to him and broken their marriage contract. And yet, instead of punishment according to the law, he chooses not to publicly disgrace or humiliate her. Joseph chose time and time again to seek and find a better way. This interruption in his life became a holy invitation. When God's messenger, <clears throat> the angel comes to him in a dream and says, do not be afraid. Where have we heard that before? When he awakes, Joseph has let go of his fear, similar fears that Mary let go of when she told the angel messenger, let it be according to your will, God. Joseph had the courage to choose a better way. He chooses to stay with Mary instead of quietly divorcing her and vows to become an adoptive parent. He chooses peace over violence, grace over condemnation. Like Mary, he chooses to say yes to God's invitation. Consider what could have happened if Joseph did not choose to heed the angel's command and take Mary as his wife. What might have happened to Mary and her newborn? Engage your imagination and ponder the other ways the Christmas story could have unfolded had Joseph made a different choice. A story transformed by making different choices. In Isaiah 35, think of all the images of transformation occurring in this prophetic vision. The land will be glad. The crocus will bloom in the desert. The glory of the Lord will be seen in all the splendor of God. Strength, salvation, the eyes of the blind will be open, ears unstopped, and shouts for joy. Gladness and joy will overtake everyone, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The prophet Isaiah envisions a holy way, where everything becomes more alert, more joyful, and more vibrant. What choices can we make each day to bring forth God's holy way? After all, isn't choosing to follow God and God's path the holy way? And always choosing the better way. 
When have our ancestors also chosen a better way? And when have they not? I am a fourth generation native of Colorado. Had my great grandparents, great great grandparents, John and Caroline Proctor, not traveled in a covered wagon from Michigan to Colorado, my great grandfather would not have been born in Loveland, Colorado, or raised his family, including my grandmother there. Had my mother not left Michigan State College after her first year and joined the Navy, she might never have lived in Coronado, California, and met and married my dad, who also had joined the Navy after college and was part of the young adult group at the Presbyterian Church in Coronado. What choices made by former generations have you inherited? How do we experience the consequences of those actions, those choices? <coughs> Recall the stories of Joseph's ancestors, such as Abraham, Jacob, Boaz, and David, all named in Matthew's genealogy. Imagine how their choices, particularly how they responded or resisted God's intervention in their lives, could have impacted Joseph. How might the choices of Joseph's ancestors have impacted his decision to choose a better way. In some ways, we each have had a Joseph moment at some time or another. Each day we are faced with opportunities to do and be better in our relationships with one another and the world. Yet, when we are faced with opportunities to put our privilege and power at risk, to do what is right, we sometimes decline to engage. But risk discomforts power. Yes, it is uncomfortable, but God meets us in those interruptions, in those moments of risk and discomfort. Where have we needed God's intervention to choose a better way? Where have we needed to say yes? Yes to God's invitation to choose a better way. A better way to say something, a better way of action, a better way of handling a situation. When has God led you to choose a better way? Perhaps you have heard about the seventh generation principle, a philosophy of the Iroquois that emphasizes how seven generations after us will be affected by our current actions and decisions. This philosophy invites us to cultivate a sacred imagination for what will come, considering what will sustain and benefit the generations who come after us, seven generations were. To do this, we must see ourselves as belonging to a web of interconnection, connected with the generations of our past as well as those in the future. Nothing is generated from complete isolation. Our world is continually shaped and reshaped by our collective choices and actions. Consider those generations before you. What have your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents passed on to you? What parts of them live on in you? And what will you pass on to the next generation and the one after that, and the one after that. We, like Joseph, have the opportunity to choose a better way. We have the choice to follow God's holy way 
and say yes to God's invitation to follow God's path. This third week of Advent, may you remember that you belong. You belong to a story etched into the wrinkles of time, to generations that have come before and will come after, to a love that won't let you go. May it always be so. Amen.